All right, here we go. <laughs> Dr. Armstrong, how are you? I'm all right, Mr. Chambers. How are you? I'm really good. Thank That's you. Quite a collection of flags there. Thank you. There's a, a couple Greek ones up there. <laughs> On the highest point, no doubt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I will lift up the screen so you can see my kids behind you there. Yeah. Say hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? Hi, everybody. Oh, boy. All right. Um, so, Dr. Armstrong, if you could start by letting the class know what you do um, in, at William Jewell and kind of what your role is. Sure. Guys, I'm a professor of political science. Um, by the way, I don't really believe that politics is a science. So I'm kind of almost doing something that I only half believe in if we talk about political science. The reason I don't believe politics is a science is that unlike anatomy or chemistry, people in my part of the world act differently if they know they're being watched. So I don't think politics is a science. But I'm a prop of political science, and I specialize in world politics so that means that I work on war and peace and the rise of China and what should we do about Syria? Is there a chance for peace between Israel and Palestine? And I also get to play around with questions of human rights and can torture ever be justified? And how should we think about whether, for example, Hiroshima was justified? That's the kind of stuff that I get to work on with great students like Mr. Chambers. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. You're welcome. Well, we'll, we'll start with... Uh, a, a basic question here to just get us going. Um, and I know that you are ready to get this one, so this will be a good one to start. From Eric President, in your opinion, what is the best type of government between a democracy and a communism? Thank you, Mr. President. I saw that, and I thought it was a great question. Okay, And, um, guys, sometimes I'm going to tell you what other people think, and sometimes I'm going to tell you what I think. This is what I think. Okay. And it's quite controversial. I mean, there's a big argument about all of this. Um, but I think in the year 2013, the evidence is overwhelming that we know what is the best form of government. The best form of government is something called liberal democracy. And by liberal democracy, I really mean a kind of government that really protects human rights, that really limits the government so that it doesn't take over all of our lives, and where all the basic questions about who gets power are decided by democratic elections. Now you can ask me, and here's the really important question, well, why is liberal democracy better than, for example, what they got in Cuba? Because in Cuba, supposedly, everybody gets a chance to go to school free, everybody gets free medical care. But here's my argument, there's three points, okay? No two liberal democracies have ever gone to war against each other. No liberal democracy has ever suffered a famine. And no liberal democracy has ever committed genocide. Now, let's take that first point. No two liberal democracies have ever gone to war against each other. Now, Mr. Chambers knows that I really mean what I'm about to say. If you can come up with a good example proving that's wrong, I will give Mr. Chambers $300 to give to you. What? Seriously? Oh, I'm very serious. This is one of the most important rules in political science. And if you can come up with a good example, then you're going to get 300 bucks, and you and I are going to write one of the most kicking articles that political science professors all over the world will read. So, Dr. Armstrong, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. The question is... Two liberal democracies have never gone to war with each other. If you can find two liberal democracies that have gone to war, three hundred dollars. From him, not me. Somebody always says, "What about the War of 1812?" That was Great Britain versus the United States. But in 1812, virtually no one in Britain could vote, not even the men. And in 1812, the United States had slavery over half of the territory. 
So you you can tell where I'm going to argue. I'm going to say, wait a minute. Neither of them can be liberal democracies. And I got a neighbor who constantly says, I think 1861. And he argues, look, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, he was elected. And I think that's kind of crazy, because even though he was elected, the government of the South wanted slavery. And you can't be a liberal democracy if you got slavery. So as far as I can tell, unless you guys come up with a really good example, no two liberal democracies, in other words, kind of like countries like ours, have ever gone to war against each other. Now, Sorry, Mr. Armstrong, we're getting an announcement. ...on the soccer field at this time for practice. Once hmm. again, attention all soccer players. You are needed at this time on the soccer field for practice. Tell me later. Come on. All right, Dr. Armstrong, keep going. Sorry. Well, has anybody got an example that proves it wrong? Uh, Taryn. Spanish War. The Spanish War. Could you be more specific? The Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American Spanish War. The Spanish-American War of 1898. Good call. But Spain was a monarchy, and the government was only partly elected, and it didn't make the key decisions. Good okay. call, though. That's a good try. Is that yours? Yes. Okay. Okay. We had the Spanish-American War for both examples. Okay. So, guys, here's the point. As far as I know, and I have tortured Mr. Chambers about this repeatedly, and he's never won the $300 either, okay? As far as I know, it's true. Now, wait a minute. Think with me. If it's true, what does it mean? If you wanted peace on planet Earth without there being one world government, or without the return, the second coming of Jesus Christ, or without the end of the occultation of the 12th Imam, which is what they believe in Shiism, well, how could you have world peace? Any Guys, think with me. If this idea is true, that no two liberal democracies have ever gone to war against each other, if we wanted to have peace for your children and your grandchildren, what can we do? Darren. Could you hear that? Uh -uh. Make everyone a democracy. Yeah, well, in particular, a liberal democracy. Yeah, good job, Darren. Dr. 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 Armstrong? Could I ask you to explain the key differences between a democracy and a liberal democracy? Very good point. Iran has elections, okay, but it's not a liberal democracy. Because to be a liberal democracy, you got to have three things, okay? Number one, the part of the government that makes war and peace decisions has to be elected by the people. And in Iran... The part of the government that makes the, the war peace decision is a guy named the Supreme Leader, and he's not elected by the people. Okay? Then number two, you have to have, now get ready for this, you have to have a free market economy. There is no example of a democracy that did not have a free market economy. There are some examples of countries that have a free market economy that are not democracies, kind of like Saudi Arabia, even though I'm not really sure we should call it a free... But there is no country that's a democracy that doesn't have a free market economy. And I think it's for a really important reason. Private property is a barrier to government power. It kind of says, look, you, 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 the government can go this far, but it can't come into my house because that's my house. And if that's right, this is one of the most important things that Karl Marx got wrong. And then number three, a liberal democracy has to strongly protect individual human rights. You have those three things, and no form of government that has those three things has gone to war against another liberal democracy. It's not had a famine. Maybe that's because it unleashes the creativity of its people. And it's never committed a genocide. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, what about what the United States did to the American Indians? Wasn't that genocide? And that's a big and complicated argument. You guys can study it under Mr. Chambers. Um, but in general, I don't think it was genocide. But more importantly, the United States wasn't yet fully a liberal democracy when it was doing that stuff. So there's my argument. In 2013, we know what the best form of government is. It's liberal democracy. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Armstrong. We'll go to the next question from Mia Ramos. Um, this question is about Syria and chemical and nuclear weapons. Mia wants to know 
what reasons Syria and countries like Syria have for trying to get nuclear and chemical weapons? That's a great question. It's a great question. Okay. Um, let's take the country of Iran. We're getting into a mess with the government of Iran because Iran probably wants to have nuclear weapons. And I think, even though you and I can't speak the Iranian language, even though you and I have never been to Iran, has anybody in your class been to Iran? Anybody been to Iran? I have someone in my family yeah. that's Iranian. We have one uh, member of our class who has a family member who's Iranian. Good, good. And one of my students in a class I taught this summer in Washington, D.C. was from Iran. And boy, was that interesting. Okay, even though we don't know the Iranian language, we don't know the Iranian religion, and we probably don't know what their favorite food is, we can probably figure out why Iran wants nuclear weapons. Here we go. The United States has never invaded a country with nuclear weapons. And the Iranians have been worried for 10 years that there are American troops to the west that used to be in Iraq. We don't have any troops there now. There are American troops to the east. That's in Afghanistan. We have a big American navy to the south. That's called the Fifth Fleet. And we have American bases in, in the stands up to the north. So if you were Iranian, you'd look at the map and you'd say, oh my gosh, we are surrounded. The Americans want to overthrow us. But America has never attacked a country, never invaded a country with nuclear weapons. Let's get nuclear weapons. Okay? By the way, I think that's why Israel got nuclear weapons. Israel, in 1948, 1967, was invaded by groups of Arab countries. So they said, since we can't really be sure that anyone will come defend us, We've got to get nuclear weapons. And in 1973, the Israeli army was almost defeated in a surprise attack by Egypt. And the one-eyed prime, the one-eyed defense minister of Israel went into the prime minister of Israel, who was a woman named Golda Meir, who had been born in <laughs> Philadelphia, by the way, and said, "Madam Prime Minister, the Third Temple is about to fall. You must activate the Samson option." The third temple. You guys know what that, that is, right? The first temple belonged to Solomon. The second temple belonged to Herod. The third temple. Israel's is about to be destroyed. You must activate the Samson option. Remember how Samson dies in the Bible. He pulls down a Philistine temple. It kills him, but it kills all the Philistine chief warriors and their king. And Israel didn't do it. But it's because the United States went to work like crazy to get the Arabs to knock it off. So I think that's the main reason countries get nuclear weapons, is that they're afraid of their security. But now you ask a good question about chemical weapons. Okay, chemical weapons are prohibited by international treaty. You're not supposed to have them. But Syria has them. By the way, until last week, they always denied that they had them. They always said, no, we don't have them. Okay, now they admit they have them. <clears throat> but they always say, look, if you guys ever meet an Israeli, especially an Israeli government official, ask, does your country have nuclear weapons? And your, if you meet an Israeli government official, they have orders. This is what they will say. No. Or they will say, I can't comment on that. Israel will never admit publicly that it has nuclear weapons. So what Syria says was, look, if the Israelis aren't going to admit they have nuclear weapons, then we need something. So we're going to get chemical weapons, and we're never going to admit that we have them. And a lot of Arabs kind of supported that, and I think it was a bad mistake. Because for the last couple of months, the Syrian government has been using chemical weapons on its own people. Since World War II, three governments have used chemical weapons one was the government of Egypt in a war with Saudi Arabia in the 1960s. One was the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein in 1988-1989. And then one is the new use by the Syrian government. Do you guys see a pattern there? It's really weird. It's kind of disturbing. Let me give you the names of those countries again. Egypt, Iraq, Syria. What's the common factor in all three of those governments? Darren? 
Uh, he says they're all led by a single leader. <clears throat> well, that's part of it. But they're all Arab. In other words, we only have three governments since the days of Adolf Hitler that have used chemical weapons, and they're all Arab. And I can't figure out what that means. What has gone wrong with Arab politics that those are the governments that have used chemical weapons? So I hope that explains a little bit about why countries want nuclear and chemical weapons. By the way, there is a treaty <clears throat> that most countries in the world have signed that says if you have nuclear weapons at the time of the treaty, you can keep them. Although you've got to, over time, get ready to get rid of them. But every government that signs a treaty agrees never to acquire nuclear weapons. North Korea signed the treaty. A couple of years ago, they got nuclear weapons, and right before they blew up their nuclear weapon, they withdrew from the treaty. Iran signed the treaty. And if they decide to get nuclear weapons, I'll bet you a pizza that right before they blow up a nuclear weapon, they're going to get out of the treaty. And that may tell you something that's really kind of disturbing for your generation and for our time. Apparently, treaties don't control government decisions. Good. Uh, yeah, Kaylin, go ahead. Then why do we have treaties? Kaylin uh, asks, why do we still have treaties after your last statement? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> let me explain that everybody believes that if somebody attacks Israel and Israel's on the verge of defeat, that the United States will defend it. There is no treaty between the United States and Israel. We have no treaty of alliance committing us to defend Israel. But everybody believes that's probably about the most important alliance that we have. Now, we do have a treaty with Mexico although I think they actually renounced it a couple of years ago, um, that says if anybody attacks Mexico, we would go to war. And then we have the weirdest treaty that we have, and that's with Japan. And the treaty with Japan says that if anybody attacks Japan, we will defend Japan. And that's all it says. Almost every other treaty says that if somebody attacks the United States, Japan will help the United States, okay? It's a weird treaty. The one we have with Japan is only to defend Japan. Well, now, why do we have those treaties? We have those treaties because it's in our interest to defend Japan. And we want other people in the region to know that if you attack Japan, you're messing with us. The most sensitive treaty that we have, it's not even really a treaty anymore, it used to be with a place called Taiwan. It's an island that's, that is part of China. And there are people on Taiwan, you guys ought to look at the map, who say that they want to declare independence and be their own country separate from China because that part, Taiwan, is a liberal democracy. And China is a communist authoritarian dictatorship. So some of them say, we want to have our own country. And China says, if Taiwan declares independence or anything that looks like it, China will go to war tomorrow. And they, by the way, the Chinese government is very serious about it. So up until the 1970s, we had a treaty to defend Taiwan. And in order to get good relations with China, we canceled that treaty. But ever since then, this is what we've said. If China attacks Taiwan unprovoked, we will go to war to defend Taiwan. But we tell Taiwan, if you ever declare independence, you're provoking China, and if China attacks, we will not defend you. You see what's going on there? So I've given you examples of where treaties matter, but they matter in order to tell other countries, look, we're going to defend that country, so don't mess around with this. And then we have some really important commitments that everybody thinks we would actually do to defend countries that we don't have treaties with. That's how complicated it gets. Uh, let's go to Jalen for a question. Uh, why would we defend Taiwan? Uh, what is our interest in defending Taiwan? Oh, man, that's a great question. Because the Chinese Army and Air Force is getting better and better. And if there were a war tomorrow, I think China would win. Which makes you wonder, why in the world would we be getting into a losing proposition? But here's the argument. Please look at the map. What you're going to see is that the part of the ocean that Taiwan controls, called the South China Sea, is so important 
That's where Japan gets almost all of its imported oil from. Um, and lots of other countries, like South Korea, they get a lot of imported oil through the South China Sea. So if China ever controls the Taiwan, then they're going to control the South China Sea. And that means that countries that are friends and allies, like Japan and South Korea, would eventually have to walk away from the United States and walk towards China. And we don't want that to happen. That is called geopolitics, or how maps influences politics. Dr. Armstrong, I'm quickly going to cover your face and show them the map. Guys, Ty this is China, the big country right here. Taiwan is this little guy right here. So, whoa, and we lost. We lost. So. All right. Um, Kaylin has a question. Are you talking about World War II? Yeah. Um, Kaylin would like to know when the treaty with Japan was signed. Was it after oh, World a War II? Great question. Yeah, it was signed in 1952. But after World War II, Japan got a new constitution. <clears throat> By the way, we agreed with this. Um, Japan was occupied by the U.S. And they were going to create a new democratic government after their military dictatorship in World War II. <clears throat> and we required them to create a democratic form of government, but J the Japanese wanted to keep the emperor, and we agreed. And the Japanese wanted to keep the kind of parliament prime minister system that Great Britain has, and we agreed. Okay? But there's one thing that, and there's, there's, a, there's a debate about this, about whether this was an American idea or there was, this was a Japanese idea. But it's called Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, and you can look it up on Wikipedia. What it says <clears throat> is that Japan will never maintain an army, a navy, or an air force. And Japan forever gives up the right to make war. Japan is the only country in the world to do that. It's, they have what's called a pacifist constitution. Now, we probably favored that because the war with Japan had been so awful. I mean, if you look at some of the great battles against Japan, like the Battle of Okinawa, 95% of the Japanese troops on that battle were killed because they would not surrender. It's awful fighting. And it was so horrible that, that a lot of Americans said, look, if the Japanese don't ever want to have an army, that's good. But somebody's got to defend Japan, so let's make a deal. So the deal was they weren't going to have an army and we would defend Japan. And now... Japan has built up a really good army and a really good navy, and the current government of Japan is thinking about scrapping Article 9 of the Constitution, and Japan would become a regular country with armies, navies, and the people who are really upset about this is China. Okay. Um, we've got about eight more minutes, Dr. Armstrong, so maybe another question or two. Um, sure. ne next one here. From Erica Lee, how do you believe the American government will fail and fall? You know, who, now who is Erica Lee? Is she in the room? She's not in the room. She's at conditioning for basketball practice. You know, I noticed there were two or three other questions like this. Like, will the United States fall like Rome fell? And I asked Mr. Chambers, why are you guys so pessimistic? Am I supposed to respond to that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, well, in, in the in the junior government class, we began our study of government by looking at the Roman Empire and thinking about the Roman Empire falling and thinking if the Roman Empire, the arguably greatest empire in the history of mankind, fell at some point, it follows the reason that America will at some point fall as well. And yeah. if we can identify why we can prolong the United States of America as long as possible? I think there are three problems, okay? But before I get to there, let me say something important. Great Britain used to be number one in world politics. It's not. But nobody has invaded Great Britain. Germany used to be the strongest military country in Europe. It's not anymore. But nobody has invaded Germany in the last few years. Remember, when the Roman Empire fell, it's because people actually invaded Rome. 
They took over Rome. They killed, slaughtered people all over Rome. Okay. I don't think that's going to happen. It didn't, even though Great Britain used to be number one, nobody's invaded Great Britain because Great Britain today has nuclear weapons. It's kind of hard to invade and take over a country that's got nuclear weapons. But the really important point, which I think you guys are getting to, is that Great Britain used to be number one, and it's not anymore. What happened? So, okay, three things. Number one, at one point, Great Britain's factories and economy was the greatest in the world, and they lost it. It's a really important question about why did they lose it. I mean, people used to want to buy stuff that was built in Great Britain. And really, almost by 1900, it, that was no longer true. And I think it's because the British had started to expect that they would always win. And they didn't do the hard, disciplined work of always making sure that their factories and economy were number one. Number two, and this is much more controversial, as Britain's economy began to decline, Britain kept spending on its military. And the argument was that Britain was overspending on its military instead of putting more money into its factories and its economy. By the way, President Obama really believes that argument. You've heard him say repeatedly, I don't want to go to any more wars because the nation we need to be building isn't overseas, it's at home. We need better schools, we need better ports, we need a better cybernet, that kind of stuff, okay? And then argument number three about why Britain fell and why it may matter to us is that eventually British politics didn't keep up. I mean, they just were not keeping up with the kind of policies that they needed. For example, Great Britain had been a free trade country. What they said was, if you can produce products that our people want to buy, then go to it, and we're going to compete with you. But about 1900, 1910, they gave up on that, and they started protecting so that their factories didn't have to compete with others. And that meant that they didn't have to have the kind of discipline that they used to have. Now, i got to tell you, I think our biggest problem in the United States right now is we're spending too much money. And if you guys look carefully, you're going to see why we're, what we're spending too much money on. And we're not spending an unusual amount of money on the military or even on the wars that we're fighting. What's bankrupting our government is what we're spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. In other words, welfare for the middle class. That's what's bankrupting our country. And the problem is, is that doing anything about it is extremely controversial politically. And so our elected members of Congress would rather pick on tiny little programs like school lunches rather than deal with really big stuff that's going to bankrupt the country um, because they just they they don't think you guys are paying attention and they're probably right that's what's going to be the biggest problem facing our country and right now we're not doing a good job of dealing with it great um quick question dr armstrong would you be willing to spend five or ten more minutes? I gotta send some of our students out to sports practices. Do you have anywhere you gotta run right away? No, I got a couple. Okay. Um, if you guys need to go to sports practices or something, now'd be a good time to scoot on out. You want to stay for another five or ten minutes? Yes, I can write some passes. Who's going to football? So what sports are they going to? I heard football. What else you got? Hi, Doctor Armstrong. Oh my gosh, how are you? <laughs> uh, Jalen, Artez, who else is going to football? Isaiah. We also have soccer and volleyball and maybe a tennis. Cheer oh, we got a cheerleader. Golf's not this season. Yeah. I gotta go to Miss Peterson. Miss Peterson. You got my name on it? Miss Peterson for Artez. Hey, hey, Josh. Like, Miss Jackson, Jackson told us. Miss yeah. Jackson told us to come finish our test after this. Yeah. Tell, tell, tell her to email me, and I'll email her. Pass. Can I have this? Can I have this? Okay. Okay. Email her. Josh, here you go. All right. Where's Josh? Tell her to email me, and I'll email her the pass. All right. We need a pass to go to Miss Peterson. Both of you need to go to Miss Peterson. Yes. Okay. And hey, Chris too. Chris, uh, uh, he going to me. Uh, Jackson. Can uh, I have a sweater though? Uh, Artez going there. 
Hey, if any of these guys leave you can actually come up with that example about liberal democracies going to war, let me know. I will. Taryn might be our, our lead runner here. You leaving? Yeah. Hey, you Dr. Armstrong, we have a policy where you can't go class to class without passes here. Apparently. <laughs> Life is a little bit different in high school. Mm -hmm. Palpable. Peterson. All right. All right. Um, so I believe that's everybody. Is there anybody left? We've got about 10 left. Oh, the, the really excellent go getters. There we go. Um, okay. I, I'd like to, in the last little bit here, let these guys who are still here, Dr. Armstrong, uh, come up and take my spot and ask you some questions. Are you okay with that? Absolutely, whichever way works best. Anybody want to come so up? They can and fire ask a question questions? through you, whichever one they want to do. Nice. Anybody? JV Honest. Hi. Hi, I'm Jerry. Huh? Go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, I'm JV Honest, and I wanted to know what is political science? Is it dealing with government or science? It definitely deals with government. Um, <clears throat> a hundred years ago, some people thought that if we wanted to have better government, we needed to make politics more like science. So what they were hoping was that we could come up with rules and laws like they have in physics, like the law of gravity, mm -hmm. and that if we could do that, we could actually make sure that there would be peace and that there would be democracy and by the way, I don't think it's worked very well. So if, I, if you want to, I would almost rather that we say that I study government and justice, but we call it political science. Okay. Thank you. Is, is that what you want to study? No. <laughs> uh, what do you want to study? Um, doctoring. I want to be a surgeon. Excellent. Now, you know who pays for most surgery in our country? No. The government. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so eventually you wind up having to deal with the kind of stuff that I get to deal with. Thank you. Yep, you bet. It's a good question. Anybody else? All right, let me finish you off with one more question, Dr. Armstrong. Hey, hey, wait, before you ask okay. me a question, what are those three flags I see in the back? Uh, we have Greece on the yeah, uh, I saw that right. One, yeah. We. We have, it's upside yeah. down, isn't it? Uh, no, not when it's hanging vertically. <laughs> okay, like okay. I would do that. Yeah. We have the don't tread on me from the revolution and the join or die snake from the re okay. revolution. Isn't the yellow don't tread on me the flag of the Tea Party? Not originally, but yes. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Just checking. Yes. Um, last question, and then we'll get out of here. And this is a question that I really, really like. Um, from Nadia Mahmoud, what is your favorite moment from history and why? I was thinking about this last night because he actually sent me this list of questions. And by the way, you guys came up with some great questions. Well, <clears throat> first of all, you need to know that I'm a Christian. So if there's any moment in history that I could go back and see myself, it would be in that period that we call Holy Week, because in one of these days, I just want to see with my own eyes what in the world was going on. That's the period from what's called the triumphant entry through the crucifixion. That would be amazing to see. I have no clue if I would understand it. But the part of history that I really like studying, there's two parts. I love almost anything about the founding of the United States. The great debates between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton and John Adams are amazing. I don't know if you guys have seen the DVD series John Adams. It's super. And it's based on a book by John Adams. And if you read that book, you come away being really impressed with John Adams and not very impressed with Thomas Jefferson. And that's really kind of interesting. And then the second period that I'm really interested in and what I work on a little bit more is World War I. I'm really interested in what caused World War I because a um, hundred years ago, a lot of people thought 
that democracy was spreading, so there wouldn't be war, that everybody was so connected economically in what we would now call globalization that there would not be war. But there was war anyway. And if you look at it, I think the biggest reason that war happened was because German power was growing and growing and growing. And a big debate has broken out in political science that today, that is the best predictor of the future of relations between the United States and China. And that's pretty pessimistic and a little bit alarming and why we need to study what happened in the causes of World War I a lot more carefully because it may turn out that it'll rock your world. You have time for one more quick question? Oh, sure. All right, Kaylin. Hi. Um, Hi, Kaylin. <laughs> um, my question is, what country do you think the next war will be between us and the another country? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, I'm hoping that it won't be between the U.S. and China. Okay? Okay. But if I had to bet right now, I'm worried about relations with Iran. Yeah. And um, we are probably entering a period where our two governments have a very big disagreement. And we're all watching to see if the new government of Iran, because they've just had elections, is going to change. But you know what's really interesting? Is almost every time we've tried to predict who will be our next enemy, we get it wrong. If you had said in 1990, after the Soviet Union collapsed, who will the United States go to war with next? And somebody had said, it'll be Iraq. People would have laughed at you. They would have said, there's no way in the world we're going to go to war with Iraq. Why in the world we're going And then, boom, we went to war with Iraq twice. And then, you know, our country has been kind of at war with a group, right? Instead of a country, we've been at war with a group called Al-Qaeda. None of us in 1990 saw that one coming. So I, I'm worried most about Iran, but I got to tell you, who knows? There may be a mistake, and it's going to turn out to be somebody else. Or maybe, maybe, we'll never go to war again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have kind of the same reaction you do. Okay. Thank you, Kaylin. All right, well, Dr. Armstrong, we'll finish with this and let you kind of make your concluding remarks. Uh, using this as a starting point. Um, if you could, because we are very big on how to get to college here at Center, so if you could tell us at what point in your life you knew that you wanted to be a professor of political science, um, or if you've reached that point yet in your career, <laughs> and, and kind of tell us about your journey from how you got to be a kid, 14, 15, like these kids are, to where you are now, and then uh, we'll end on that. Okay. Um, when I was 16, the world changed completely. That was the year 1979. And the government of Iran, the imperial government of Iran, fell in a revolution. And we all watched it on our TV screens. We saw the immortals, the imperial bodyguard of the Shah of Iran, with these amazing black uniforms go out to try to stop the revolution, they just fell apart. It was absolutely fascinating. Then in 1979, for the first time ever, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. And in 1979, Israel formed a peace treaty with Egypt. There was so much going on in the world, I said, gosh, this is fascinating. And so when I went to, um, I decided I was going to go to college, and my first idea to go to college was I was going to go to the Naval Academy. And I was going to be a Navy officer. But it turned out almost everybody goes to the Navy Academy are engineers. They don't really study political science. They study chemistry and math and that kind of stuff. And I am really glad that I didn't go to the Naval Academy because I wasn't particularly good at that stuff. Instead, I went to the University of Oklahoma. And I went there kind of because of a family tradition. And I decided I was going to study political science and I was going to go to law school. And then I just got really interested in all this stuff that was going on in the world, and I decided to start studying and looking at foreign policy. 
And when I graduated from OU, I had an offer from one of our interesting intelligence agencies. And I was trying to decide between doing that or going on to graduate school at a place called Georgetown University. And I decided to go to Georgetown University. And I just got really lucky there. I worked for a woman named Madeleine Albright, who was an amazing teacher and who eventually became the Secretary of State of the United States. Um, and she really was a great teacher. And I just suddenly realized I was having so much fun. So here's the story, guys. When I was your age, I kind of knew stuff that was interesting to me, and I was willing to work hard to learn about it. But then I had my plan, right? I was going to go into the government and work for one of the interesting agencies, and my plan got totally changed. And I'm really lucky because now I'm paid a decent salary to do a job I love on a topic that I'm really interested in, and a lot of it was sheer luck and being willing to work hard and when the moment came, just to go that way. So if right now you're kind of feeling like, I'm kind of interested in this stuff, and I'm willing to work hard at it, then think about studying that. And if you don't yet know what the next step is, just be open and flexible, because you have no clue what cool thing is going to come around the corner as long as you're willing to grab it. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Armstrong. We, we appreciate your time, and... Uh... We'll talk to you soon. You got a good group. Good question. Talk to you guys later. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you.